digital transformation and more recently global business services and intelligent automation. Prior to founding Chasey, which is 15 years ago, I actually had a couple, uh, some operational roles, including the corporate controller at 3Com Corporation in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I was a business unit CFO at uh, one of the Ascendant business units. Um, so I've, I've had very much a practical background before uh, establishing Chasey Partners in 2006. I'll hand over to Chewy to introduce himself. Chewy. Thanks, Ian. Uh, been around, happy to be here, looking forward to this session. Uh, been around IT and transformation for over 20 years, last 15 years, also very close to shared services. And over the last six years, very focused on automation in different shapes and forms. So happy to be here. Thank Esteban? You. Thanks, Chuy. Uh, my name is Esteban Carrillo. Good afternoon, everyone. For those who are in, my, in the same time zone I am, I am based in Brazil. I've been in Chasey for the last 11 years, implementing and optimizing shared service centers across the Latin American region. Prior joining Chasey, I was the finance and shared services director for Dell EMC and uh, Tricom. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Esteban. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is, again, just to touch on what we're going to be doing here, just a little bit of background on Chasey Partners for, for a minute or two, which I'll, I'll do. Then I'll lead the discussion on some of the top trends shaping shared services GBS agenda. Then I'll hand over to Chewy, who will talk a lot more about the latest in automation, hyper automation, digitalization. And then Esteban will close this out with, you know, what does next generation look like a more practical guide to what you need to do and what next steps you might want to take on that journey. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned Chasey Partners, uh, founded in 2006, uh, head, currently headquartered in California, where I'm based. Uh, we, we do uh, soup to nuts, end to end, business case, roadmaps, design, build, deploy of new operating models. Um, our, three, our three main service pillars are traditional, inverted commas, shared services and global business services, um, robotic process automation, intelligent automation, which is uh, what we've suddenly focusing on that summer today, and then broader business transformation, which actually, to be honest with you, is most of our engagements is broader business transformation and then involve shared services and RPA to some, to some degree. Um, we do focus mainly on back office services, but not exclusively. So think finance, HR, IT, procurement, facilities, et cetera, and customer contact centers uh, and, and call centers, we support those as well. And our main difference from a USP is, as you probably heard from the introductions, we're a practitioners first, not consultants by birth. We have hands-on experience rolling out and implementing these operating models that we bring to our client engagement. So we believe that's a USP, an unique selling point of, of us and the team and the company. Okay. This is a splash of client portfolio on a page. I'm not going to read the names, but we are across mul uh, no, multiple industries. On the left-hand side in the middle, you can see our our clients by, by main industry grouping. Uh, towards the right, you have our public sector clients in higher education, government, and, and non-government non um, bodies. And on the right-hand side, you have some of our clients in the intelligent automation space, RPA, and uh, et cetera. So just on a page there, of course, we've got many clients, many multinationals over many years. Okay, now to get stuck into the actual session today. What are some of the trends facing shared services GBS professionals today? Well, there's a lot of them. There's a lot, there's a lot coming at everyone, a lot coming at uh, the, the people in shared services and GBS. By the way, shared services as a concept, as, as an operating model has been around probably for you know, 25, 30 years now, since the mid eighties, when I first came across it. Doesn't mean there hasn't been centralization, et cetera, before, but as an operating model, defined operating model since the mid eighties. And since then it's been through a number of cycles of evolutions be it you know, expansion of scope, offshoring, outsourcing, new technology, uh, moving up the value chain, um, in, in, uh, te technology in general, um, bringing stuff onshore, offshore. I mean, there's been so many movements of, of evolutions of shared services over the last 30 years. The thing I would say about today is things are happening so fast that the trends are moving quickly. So if you're in shared services or GBS, you have to adapt quickly. And, and actually Esteban will be talking a little bit about that in more detail later. But just to touch on some of the main trends here, automation and digitalization is significant. There are so many technology opportunities and tools out there. The, the trick is actually which ones do you go for? 
But in, in addition to what, what I would call traditional technology around ERP, enterprise resource planning, document management workflow, uh, uh, case management, those sort of tools that are really what I call almost prerequisites for any shared services GBS. You have a lot of new tools around our robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, social media and mobile tools, machine learning, et cetera. I'm not gonna dwell on that because Chewy's gonna talk a lot about that later, but it's clearly one of the top trends facing shared services. Number two is the one office concept. You may have heard that concept. It's, a, it's actually a, a term coined by my friends at HFS, Horses for Sources, but it actually encapsulates a number of uh, trends around the provision of services to the business. And I'm gonna come back to that a little more, bit more detail but you, you hear these traditional breakdown of front, middle and back offices and by business partnership and value chain. Well, that's where I think this sort of comes together to some degree with a one office concept where, where supply chains and integration has to be a lot tighter. And I'm gonna come back to that a little bit more in, in, in a moment. The future of work. So you've heard that expression, I'm sure out there. And what, what does that mean? It means, you know, how does work get done? Who does it get done by? What sort of, what sort of team dynamics do you have to have in place? Where do those people need to be located? How, what tools are they gonna to use? What sort of training do they need? And again, I'll touch on that. And then Esteban will drill into a little bit more detail around the, the people side of that a little bit later. Agility and resilience. Now, clearly we've had a lot of sh uh, shocks, global shocks, macro shocks over the last year and, and over the last number of years. And sh shared services and GBS teams need to be able to react to those shocks. So a lot of organizations have, have needed quite rightly to revisit their business continuity and business resilience plans, look at their processes, make sure they're documented, make sure you have appropriate backup, make sure you have appropriate tools to support that. And so we'll be talking a little bit about that now. And again, Esteban will drill down on that a little bit later. Next generation shared services, you, you probably heard that term. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, as we look forward, shared services GBS is evolving rapidly in line with these trends. And that means you need to look at how you're gonna staff and optimize and run your, your shared services teams, which includes vitally talent optimization. So the way work gets done today, not just from a physical perspective, but from an operational day-to-day -day perspective, how the, the moves in generations, the, the expectations from staff and employees have changed so dramatically over the last few years, which brings a lot of opportunities, but also bring some challenges about how you manage and develop and train and, and coordinate those teams in a, in a distributed, remote, fast working environment. So opportunities and challenges associated with that. And then, of course, we talk about the GBS model, G global business services, which is really we have, we have some separate we've done separate presentations on GBS and the, ten, the, 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 the we're not intending to define and drill down on GBS today, but as an operating model, if you really wanna get into that, you know, top quartile, best practice, uh, highest efficiency, best control, the GBS multifunctional, multi-level, multi-technology enabled model is, is the best from a benchmarking and goal perspective. So a lot of organizations, even if they were traditionally more functional shared services or siloed shared services or specific to, um, specific countries or regions are moving towards a more global model because the scalability and opportunities that come with that are significant for, for any enterprise. And then lastly, don't forget, it's all about performance because one thing I've said is shared services isn't there for itself. It's a, it's a, it's a goal, it's there to provide a service to its customers. It's not an end in itself. Don't forget that, so it's all, always about providing that quality service to your business. It's about defining performance. It's about meeting your commitments. It's about delivering on the promise. It's about, and more recently as well, it's about making sure that the huge volume of data that is available to shared services is not only coordinated, managed appropriately, but is made available and is trusted data. So this, these are some of the main trends out in the shared services in GBS. Going on a little bit more about that sort of traditional shared services, if there is such a thing in, in all these evolutions, was if you look, you know, go back a few years, was generally, hey, let's centralize everything in a single location or, or maybe a couple of locations or maybe a location by region. And that would bring economies of scale, standardization. You'd have a, a tight, a, generally a tighter, more consistent control environment. And often 
you'd be able to benefit from labor arbitrage by moving to a lower cost location from a higher cost location. You generally have focused on your non-core, but what we call mission critical services, mainly around transactional, but maybe some professional services. And there would be, which is still a huge component, a specialization. So you're not be moving from a generalist model to a more specialist model. And then of course the client focus, which is as prevalent today as it was then, but it's obviously had to adapt around understanding what your client needs are, defining those client needs, having service partnership agreements in place as opposed to service level agreements, measuring and tracking and reporting on your performance, having a mindset of continuous improvement and being commercial are all some of the key components on traditional shared services. So what's going on today? So COVID-19, again, about 12 months ago since it really impacted uh, global business, has, has accentuated um, escalated uh, uh, and accelerated some of these requirements around resilience. So you've had the work from home phenomenon, business continuity. So a lot of companies have had to brush off their business continuity plans and, and, uh, and, and bring them to the fore. You, you had to look at how you outsource, how you use your supply chain, where your data is stored and how your managed knowledge is shared around the organization. So that's around resilience. From digitalization, and again, Shirley will talk about this, how, how have you able to use automation and cloud versus on-site premises? How have you able to track your legacy versus your, your you know, new systems? Uh, the concepts of virtualization, and of course, collaboration communication tools have absolutely come to the fore, but this is all part of the trend that was in place. It's been accelerated and accentuated. And then one office, it's about enterprise-wide capabilities, performance management and measurement, end-to-end -end process and analytics. Okay, next slide, please. All right, from a locational perspective, just circling back to one comment I made on the previous slide, or one of, one of the comments I made on the previous slide, historically, traditionally, shared services were sometime linked, and actually we've been talking about this for years, shared services is a centralization of an operating model as well as traditionally around locations. The centralization standardization of operating model reporting lines and structures is still prevalent and still as critical today as it always was. However, the physical location restrictions around shared services have evolved. So traditionally, you'd have one shared services physical office, brick and mortar as we call it, central location, and the teams would be hired into that location. There would be labor arbitrage play, you would, uh, generally have most of your people in shared services, not always all of them, but most of them work out of those physical locations. And you could have an element of hub and spoke, so a main central location, and then a spoke either in the same country or in another country. For example, at 3Com back in the day, we had a, a central location in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and a hub in Brazil. Uh, as an example, both physical locations. Uh, and then you can, you still have that, that's a traditional model, but with what does remote versus virtual mean? Actually, there's a lot of confusion and overlap between those. So we've come up with a, what we believe is our definition. You can have your own definition, but our definition is that remote is where some of the work for the team members, the employees, the staff is done outside of a physical office, i.e. work from home, but they are still attached to a physical location. So we have sort of two components of remote. They could either be almost always remote, but be still be attached to a, a physical location where uh, um, their managers sit or where team meetings happen or where the office is located. Or they could, for example, work two days at home or three days at home, two days on site a week. And that's what we call hybrid remote. So remote is where a person is always uh, working remotely, but still reporting into a location. Hybrid remote is where th there is a mixture of on-site and off-site. So th the key is there, they're still attached to a physical location uh, in, in, in as physically a central office or offices plus supported from uh, remote locations. And then virtual is actually where there, again, this is a definition, it's just there, there are overlaps, is where there are no physical offices, right? Everybody's virtual. Everybody works out of their home location you can still have centralized reporting lines. You can still have centralized operating models, but you don't, from a locational perspective, have everyone either situated in 
or reporting to and occasionally going to a physical location. So that's what we call working from home in multiple locations, no physical office location. Okay. I think there's a question come up, which you maybe can take take at the end of this. Uh, we'll, we'll take it at the end of this section. Maybe you can just check what the question is, one of you guys, and if it should be asked now, we can take it now. So what are some of the um, differences between these traditional hybrid remote and virtual from, from a standardization scalability? You can see it on the left, I don't need to read it. Now, just to, before I start speaking, this isn't a, a statement of absolutes. This is a statement of relative, okay? So actually, I'll tell you, when we first did this slide, we had high, average, and low. And it said, no, 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 it's higher, average, and lower. They're relative. They can all have these things. A traditional model and a hybrid remote and virtual can all have, for example, scalability you see on the second column. But it's just a comparison between each of the three. But traditionally, so traditionally, uh, you, you know, you'd have standardization. It, was, it would be easier, in inverted commas, to, to standardize, scale, have a tight control environment and have that labor arbitrage play in, in physical locations. But business resilience and talent retention can be more challenging, right? If you have all your eggs in one basket from physical location perspective, that can cause significant issues around BCP, for example, business continuity. And actually it can be more challenging to, if you're more restricted in your talent pool. And actually it can be also, you know, especially in the new generation, uh, less attractive to work in a physical location all the time. Hybrid remote, again, which I've defined as defined in the previous slide, there's some of these things are maybe more challenging. Still, you can still achieve them though, but scalability, more distributed control environments, you've got people working from home, so you have to make sure that data is secured, you have to make sure access is secured, you have to make sure you know there's VPNs in place. So it doesn't mean you can't have a very tight control environment, but it can be more challenging. Labor arbitrage, you can still benefit from. Resilience can potentially be improved uh, compared to the, to the traditional model because you have people located. So if something went down in a one location, you still have people available or ready to work from home. And actually it can be supportive of talent retention to some degree as well. In the virtual model, work from home, multiple locations, I'll go right to the bottom. From a resilience and talent retention perspective, that can be really advantageous especially in the newer generations who like to, we are, in fact, we all like working, having the flexibility to work from home. And so this actually is very attractive from a talent retention perspective. As long as you support the, the people development side of that the, and, and the team spirit and the team training and the consistency, then, then it can be a real advantage. And resilience, of course, you don't have a physical location that will go down. From a control environment, scalability can be more challenging. And then labor arbitrage, you, you, you have to be a little bit clever. You can't just go to one or two lower cost locations if you have people distributed. The flip side is having a virtual model, you can actually pick some of the lower cost locations as well, which is why it says average. Um, so these are just some of the comparisons that you think about this. I will say that the hybrid remote slash virtual is where a lot of organizations are moving towards, especially hybrid remote. Hybrid remote is the one we recommend for organizations right now because virtual comes with challenges. So virtual is, is, is as, as scalability and consistency improves, it's gonna to continue to move on there, but we can say for sure hybrid remote, remote operating models with some central location is, is organizations are following. And I will, before I move on, GBS and shared services has really shown itself to be uh, to be a, a great enabler in the, in following the recent pandemic. For many of our companies and clients, they were able to step up to the challenge of providing consistent ongoing services through that, through that challenge. Okay. Yeah, Phil, there, there is yeah. a question. There yeah. is a question. Uh, can you say more about standardization being average under virtual? Yeah. So, so, Again, uh, it's a good question. I was trying to touch on that. W what I mean is if, if people aren't, again, it's entirely possible to standardize in a virtual model, but it's more challenging, right? Because the people aren't situated in the same location, in the same teams, sharing best practice on an ongoing basis. Managing virtual teams and virtual way of doing things can result in more inconsistent ways of doing things, just like in the old siloed country. So 
again, I would stress, does not mean you can't have standardization in virtual. You can, but you then have to have those other control mechanisms in place, like documentation, like training, like support, like development. If you have those, you can achieve it. It's just more challenging in a virtual environment. That's, that's what I mean by that. Thank you. Any other questions before I move on? Uh, did you see come up, Esteban, we can take now? Yes, there is another comment from Aaron. Uh, in his experience, customer experience should be a key component of client focus. The stakeholders' requirements are evolving. Their organization are flattening and the stakeholders are expected to do more with less. Reduction of the stakeholders' overhead in interacting with shared services to enable the stakeholders to focus on their key, on their core business is key. Can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. So let's hold that question. So, so thank you for the question, but let's move on. Here we go. So customer experience, I think it links direct to the question just asked. So I'm not saying, I'm not taking this HFS virtual one off and say, voila, you know, this is the culmination of 25 years of shared service. I'm just using the, the HFS virtual one office description to actually support some of the things I've said and some of the things that Esteban and, and, and Chewy are going to say in a second. I think some of the components of this virtual one office are fundamentally linked to GBS shared services and supported by GBS shared services, right? I'm not saying the whole virtual one office is the same, but to the question, to the point, customer experience, customer value, customer delivery have always been critical in shared services, but even more so now in the one office because it's all about providing customer experience to the enterprise. One of the challenges around the shared services outsourcing in previously was almost this out of sight, out of mind mindset. Oh, put that stuff, accounts payable, put that, you know, uh, employee administration, put, send it offshore somewhere. We don't care about that. It's non, not strategic. That under the one office is not the case anymore. Everything is integrated, process data, it's all about outcome driven. If you talk about the outcome driven front office, as it says here, shared service GBS not only can, but needs to understand that it's all about that. And the human centric employee experience as well is critical. So everyone is digitally enabled, no, both from a, a skill set, but an expectation set. Employees, stakeholders, everybody expects things to be a digital, expects to be able to get what they need off their phone. Okay. Um, so digital workforces, analytics and cognitive processes, machine learning here. Again, Chewy will talk about that. What you'll see on the outside of us is us pointing arrows in as to what, how shared services and or GBS supports and is consistent with one office. I'm not gonna to spend too much longer than that. The point at the bottom here, I think is critical as well. It's about connecting more closely the front, middle and back office. That's what it's about to create touchless and frictionless digital experience and that is crucial. I mean, shared services has been talking about going up the value chain and, and taking, connecting to the middle office for, for decades. It's really happening now. But before I move off this slide, I want to say one other thing. This doesn't mean that we're moving back to a generalist model, right? In terms of what I call the jack of all trades, individuals in organizations having to know everything about everything all the time. So in, let's take the finance example, having to know, you know, to do decision support, be a strategic business advisor, but at the same time, understand process accounts payable, deal with disputes, understand technology uh, at the process level. No, specialization is still critical as part of the model. So you still get your traditional shared services, you still get your professional and technical centers of expertise, you still got your business partnering, you still got your compliance and strategy. It's just that they have to be more integrated and connected. That's what is critical. So I just wanted to say that. All right, I'm nearly done. Any more quick questions, uh, Esteban, or we can move on? We can move on. Please. Okay, let's move on in interest of time. So, so we're going to touch on the role of predictive analysis. I'll take the first slide and then hand to Chewy. First slide. Okay, transformation is inevitable. The fourth industrial revolution is coming. So this is that. This is you may have heard this. With that lead in, Chewy, take it. Take it from there for now. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. And for industrial revolution, not. Huh? that the, the speed of the current uh, breakthroughs has no precedent before, right? So we have the first, second, third revolution, uh, but, but when you think about this fourth revolution compared to the previous, it's all about speed. It's all about speed. The fourth revolution, it's evolving exponentially, right? Rather than in the previous revolution, which is more linear, it's more disrupting, 
because it's touching every industry, every country, every individual around the world. So when I think about the possibilities of you know, billions of people connected through mobile devices, uh, unprecedented, process, unprecedented uh, processing power, a lot of data, right? So, so the storage capacity around the world, the access to knowledge, right? Immediate knowledge, immediate access, it's unlimited. And, and these possibilities are touching, as I said, right? Multiple countries, multiple fields, multiple industries, uh, we're going to talk more about <clears throat> RPA and we're going to talk about more artificial intelligence. But, you know, outside of these technologies that are very relevant to shared services, there are other technologies uh, like the Internet of Things, uh, 3D printing, nanotechnology and so forth. Right. So already artificial intelligence, it's all around us. Right? It's all around us. Uh, you can see it in self self driven, driven cars. You can see it in drones. Uh, from an RPA perspective, uh, we now see a lot of virtual assistants. Uh, and in recent years, uh, this is this has grown exponentially, and the expectation is that this trend continues. Right. So it's all about speed, and it's all about exponential exponential growth. And and uh, Phil touched on you know key trends from a shared services and GBS perspective. Uh, one of them being, you know, digital transformation, one of them being automated processes and hyper automation. According to Gartner, over the last six quarters uh, or so, hyper automation, it's, it's top, right? Uh, more and more organizations, more and more individuals, uh, they're looking into what is next after RPA. So hyper automation is actually the combination of multiple technologies and, and what that gives you, right, that, that allows you, it's to uh, faster, faster deployment, more complex automations. And, and this combination of trends like RPA, artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural, process, uh, natural language processes, even process mining can take care of more complicated, more complex processes. And you can deploy these automations at a faster speed. So RPA, as a standalone, it's not hyper automation. Hyper automation requires this combination of tools. Uh, it, it can be all. It, it can be understood like in practical terms, right? Like the augmentation, right? That means more complex. That means faster automations, and and being able to connect with other important technologies like artificial intelligence and and you know advanced analytics. So how do you take this to the next level, right? How do you move from hyper automation to hyper connection? As, as I said before, hyper automation is this combination of technologies, whereas blockchain, it's uh, the distributed ledger and it's technology that enables digital access to be transacted and moved in real time. Uh, so how, how blockchain enables a, a hyper connected model? When, when you look at any given, any given marketplace, all participants have to be connected. Today, this is, achieved, this is achieved, right? Through uh, HubSpot model, industries and businesses exist. Uh, and, you know, examples like Google and Amazon are obvious examples, right? Of such platforms and business models that integrate all participants and facilitate all transactions. And that has proven to be very useful, but having a proprietary market platform also as at to the whole system, cost, right? Cost and friction. More important, these platforms also, uh, what they give you, right? This, this blockchain combination with hyper automation is that you, you eliminate this intermediation, uh, you eliminate this customer interface intermediation and transfer the customer relationship, uh, the complete customer relationship to, to the business. And with blockchain, uh, you can build this kind of marketplace. Um, transformation journey, right? Transformation journey, um, you know, just like, just like shared services, just like GBS, this is all about a journey, right? This is not, this is not a destination, it's a journey. In how do you evolve your automation programs? Digital, di digital transformation, it's key, right? So, so today is a must, right? Today is a must to have a proper automation program. From a corporate cultural perspective, it also means how do you how do you shift you know the mindset 
in your employees uh, to digital to a, to a digital man, mindset, right? So it's it's not only it's not only about technology, but it's also about culture and how do you move from the traditional way of thinking to a digital way of thinking. Uh, of course, right? As this evolves, new skills are going to be required and new roles are going to be required. Roles are actually transforming with you know this new era of technology. And and as we said before, right? Hyper automation is a mix of different technologies and, and it's another a step into your journey, right? So you start, you start from the very basic RPA and then you start moving towards hyper automation, uh, adding, adding new technologies like machine learning, adding chatbots, adding artificial intelligence uh, elements, and of course, right, advanced analytics, which is very important. The watch now, as I mentioned, is blockchain, right? And, and, and there, are, there are other technologies and trends, right? That may or may not apply to all organizations, but certainly worth watching. Uh, like blockchain I mentioned, right? Advanced analytics uh, and citizen development, right? There's a lot of talk about citizen development and, and the concept is you know, end users creating their own automations, citizen developers with you know, tools so they can, you know, drive change, drive transformation. Uh, and according to one of the most recent Gartner reports, 60% uh, or so of organizations are either moving towards citizen development or are thinking or planning about uh, citizen development. Well, there's a question, Shirley. I'm going to read it because it's a really good question. It's come up. It says, who do, who do you see as the owner of digital transformation? The question is very specific, and I don't think the answer is a yes or no, but is it IT or is it shared services? Uh, I think it's both, right? I think that, that more and more what, what we're seeing, Phil, uh, is that shared services are becoming the catalyst of automation and digital transformation. And there's a very simple reason for that, right? It's as you evolve your GBS and your shared services, more transactional and value-added processes are moving to shared service centers and to GBS. Therefore, the, the shared services becomes, you know, the perfect ground for automation. Lots of transaction, lots of automation potential. But, but, but then what happens, right? Your, your GBS shared service employees, they start becoming RPA experts. So, so not only you create the automations, on the top of it, there's a layer of knowledge about RPA and hyper automation. And more and more we're seeing shared service centers and GBS becoming the launch platform of automation programs for the rest of enterprise, moving from the you know, more traditional back office automation to a front office automation. So I know that this is a long-winded uh, answer, right? But, but it's GBS, right? With part and partnering with IT and partnering with IT. Absolutely. I don't know if you have uh, uh, other uh, no. perspectives, Stevan or Phil, or just keep keep going. I think, I think I think in the interest of time, better keep going, Chewy. Okay, good. And this is my last turn, and then I'm gonna turn it over to to, to Stevan, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, and I just mentioned there, right? So so it's your moving transactional process to shared service centers, then automating those transactional processes, acquiring the knowledge at the organizational level in shared service center and then becoming the launch platform. In, in order to become a launch platform, a COE is required, right? If you wanna scale, if you wanna scale RPA, you need, you need a COE. And COE becomes, as I said, right, the catalyst of your hyper automation program, right? And, and, and you focus from discovery to through building the bots, through managing the bots, and very important, right? How do you crowdsource ideas? How do you invite the rest of the organization to become part of automation, part of your automation program? And, and, and how do you reach out to those places, organizations, and individuals that had not thought about automation and RPA in the past? So you can assist them and guide them, right? To and take those teams to, the, to, to an understanding of what automation means for, for their specific processes. And last but, but not least, you have to measure it, right? How are your bots operating in, in production? What is the value that the, those bots are bringing to the business? And what are some sort of utilization of licenses? So many aspects around um, 
the advanced analytics that are very applicable to RPA and that in combination, they become some sort of your hyper automation suite. So said that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stella. Is there any other question or? But the only comment, the only comment I would make is that last that last slide is, is sort of touches on the question to some degree. I mean, SSCs and GBSs are becoming a launch plant from our from RPA, but but our, different organisations. Sometimes you have a sort of a digital chief digital officer uh, who tends to be sometimes more IT. So, but regardless, there has to be a partnership between uh, shared service GBS and IT. But GBS shared services could absolutely drive the 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 opportunity. The engagement and the scaling that that's the critical point because to Chewy's point they have the skill set they, they, they can see the opportunities as well yeah okay Good. thank you thanks Chewy uh, so in, in this last section uh, we will be touching on how the shared service center will need to be transformed in the next generations and how we believe shared services organizations should prefer to assume a much more critical role in the business of organizations the importance of defining a sustainable operating model to face the future and how to leverage the digital transformation and tools and technologies that will enable this new reality. So if we, if we look at this slide, um, in, in today's environment, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has challenged the conventional setup of shared services even more than what we were expecting even before this pandemic um, as part of the digital transformation. As we approach the post pandemic area, organizations will be facing a huge pressure to be more agile in order to, quote, to quickly adapt to challenging business needs and demands. Uh, shared services will need to raise its contribution to drive business information and intelligence, including enhanced data analytics to support the business in achieving its goal, but also, and this is still very important, still operating under unprecedented pressures to reduce cost and resources to deliver on the more traditional back office responsibilities. So part of the solution to achieve this pace of performance is what we call next generation shared services. And there are mainly four key areas that I would like to focus today. The first one is digitalization and automation as Chewy described it before. Next generation shared service centers will be highly digitized and self-service enabled where users will have access to real-time information leveraging internal and external data to produce online reports. When we think about digitalization and automation, shared services will need to focus on all those aspects that Chui has already mentioned. This is basically what Chui was talking about when, what Chui was talking about hyper-automation. The next key item or the next key area is resilient operating models. We're talking about building a strong operating model uh, that does not only point to efficiency and effectiveness, but also improve the resilience of the organization. Many shared service centers are working remotely today and those that they are currently doing it really well are those that they already have clear decision-making processes. They have documented and updated process workflows they, they use desktop procedures. They have individual performance metrics to know what the team is doing rather than managing the team um, by walking the corridor. So this is really a, a key important, important uh, message regarding how organizations are currently uh, building resilience. Um, it's not only that, but also identifying alternative options, including selective PPO, RPA, virtual shared services, remote working, uh, revamping your business continuity plans, etc. The third item that I would like to talk is regarding strategic partnerships. And this links to the comment uh, that Phil made about one office concept. The approach should be to change towards creating a work culture where people at shared services are encouraged to spend more time interpreting and analyzing data, um, understanding the needs of the front end of the business and ensuring that support functions keep pace with the front office, from the front office. Of course, 
we will all need to make sure that we can keep operations running by paying bills, responding to customers, processing invoices. But if we can't be proactive and see how we can reduce time um, that we are currently spending on transactional activities, as an example, uh, creating a better customer experience as one of the panelists uh, just mentioned, using digital channels, we will never create work cultures that appeal the next generation talent to take the organization forward. The next item that I would like to talk is regarding enhanced performance and capabilities. And this links to a number of considerations. We will need a leadership to promote consistent vision and high performance culture. Many traditional shared service centers, uh, uh, many traditional leadership roles within shared service centers are responsible for tactical activities like reducing costs and improving problems. Next generation leaders in shared services must also uh, be strategic visionaries who can help the shared services enhance its uh, partnership with the business units and build a high performance culture, delivering analytics, adopting a continuous improvement mindset. The second area um, that it's also um, um, applicable for um, enhanced performance and capabilities is governance. Uh, we really need a governance that helps transform shared service performance. Many traditional shared service centers uh, establish governance models that they would in initially set up as a formality. It only exists in paper. In the next generation shared service center, this approach is no longer sufficient and we will need to highly, uh, to, to, to basically um, engage a highly active cross-functional governance body that they can evaluate KPIs and costs in real time, providing a strategic operational and tactical guidance to improve performance. Next slide, please, uh, Chui. So one of the reasons why uh, traditional shared service centers are not performing well is due to the lack of a focus on the needs of the clients. And this again links to the one of its concept that Phil was mentioning. In the next generation shared services, it will be essential to understand the needs of the client at the corporate, regional, and local levels, and how to meet those needs more efficiently and efficiently. Best in class shared service organizations channel services and client interactions through a well structured client interaction framework. These organizations are aware that although they may only control a part of the process, the end-to-end -end nature of the process means that the real value add of the process could, could take place at either end, whether in the, in the shared services or in the business. So we should probably, we should definitely need to take an end-to-end -end perspective. So we look here, so the nine components, I will not be describing all of them, but uh, we have account management, which is basically being the voice of the customer within the shared service center. We have contact management, defining the regular interactions with clients and how the regular interactions are, are managed uh, with clients. Service partnership agreements, also known as service level agreements. Uh, we call them shared service partnership agreements because it represents a two-way agreement between shared services and the client. Um, we also need to develop feedback mechanism to understand perception of the client, process control database, absolutely critical, uh, documenting end-to-end -end processes um, to, and updating them as we start automating and incorporating the, our uh, continuous improvement initiatives. Performance measurement, um, I will be talking about that in the next slide. And this also includes, of course, performance reporting that defines how process uh, performance should be reported in detail and reviewed by shared services and uh, clients on a regular basis. Chargebacks. Uh, so all these items should, uh, and in any best in class shared service organization should definitely be developed um, to make, to make sure that uh, you know we, 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 we treat the internal customer as it is an external customer. And this links back to Phil's comments about uh, one office. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so KPIs. Within the client interaction framework, the performance of each process is measured in terms of how it delivers on client requirements. Um, 
it is important that the performance is measured on both sides of the service partnership. So we are talking about input KPA, KPAs, uh, also known as reverse or leading KPAs, where we are measuring the client's input into the process. Uh, the key concept here is that in order for the shared services to meet the expectations agreed, it is critical that the inputs uh, to the process uh, are received on a timely and in compliance with the agreed standards. So we definitely need to measure uh, the input KPA, KPAs. Operational KPAs, measuring basically effectiveness and efficiency of the process. Um, these are not necessarily shared with clients, uh, but they are usually used to determine if the engine room is achieving its operational targets and working as a team. An additional important subcomponent of operational KPA, KPIs uh, is creating KPIs on an individual level as we are moving into a remote working scenario right now. So next generation shared service centers, they are putting a lot of focus on building individual KPIs to measure people that are currently working remote. And finally, obviously output KPIs um, that are used to measure the success, quality, and effectiveness of the service delivery. Uh, so next generation shared services, um, when we look at how, this is, how they are dealing with all these KPAs, uh, they are matching automation capabilities and data visualization technologies to create clear and actionable online metrics reports. They will be also using advanced analytics tools to forecast future service volumes and predict effects of potential workload changes. This is what it's, I mean, how next generation shared services organizations are currently working to support uh, the digital transformation. Are there any questions? No? Okay. So what are the- I, 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 Esteban, there's uh, probably about you know five minutes and then we'll see if there's any uh, outstanding questions. If, okay. Okay, excellent. So what are, I, I will probably stop but in, in the main enabling functions uh, to enable uh, next generation shared service centers. So the first one is global business process. While the traditional role of global process owner is to provide consistency and standardization in major end-to-end -end processes like purchase to pay, hire to retire, this role improve, um, is becoming more relevant as it improves the ability of shared services to work across organizational boundaries, boundaries for end-to-end -end processes coordinating activities between multiple departments, uh, finance, operations, sales, procurement. And this links back to the comment that uh, Phil was making about one office. We need all the areas working together to improve the customer experience and global process owners could be the glue that holds them together by aligning and coordinating activities between multiple functions. We already talked about customer interaction framework, so I will skip that one. Change management. Uh, so again, the evolution of shared services to next generations comes with major challenges, including transformation related to technology, processes, and people's roles. So many next generation shared service organizations are making investments, including a dedicated change management resource, resource to, to, to support communications. Centers of excellence, um, shared services and GBS organizations um, that have been in the business of delivering improving services um, develop some implicit capabilities, uh, capabilities. These capabilities could be analytics, continuous improvements, project and change management, intelligent automation, customer experience. Uh, so these, are, these capabilities could be consolidated under a center of excellence and leverage across the company. Um, so next generation shared services recognize the value of leveraging this common centralized hub to develop these capabilities. Um, business technology, I will also skip it as Chuit mentioned um, how this is linked to to, to, to the next generation um, organization. And finally, as next generation shared services move up the value chain, the relationship between shared services and the customer will change. Moving up the value chain or expanding the scope will depend on stakeholders sharing the skin of the game, giving 
giving up more and more process control. So shared services will not be fully capitalized in the next generation uh, without a proactive commitment of all parties involved. And that's where we would need a governance establish, establishing joint accountability between business and shared services to provide that framework that will enable moving up the value chain. So where should we start? Next slide, please. So right, just, just one question come over. I'm just going to quickly jump on this. It says, what services do, do, that are not traditional back office functions are right for centralizing or sharing? That's a, we can we can spend some time answering that. It'll take a while, but just to throw some out there. Um, there are things like talent acquisition. There are things like reporting and data and analytics. Some of the some of the uh, the uh, intelligent automation digitalization that Chewy talked about. There's contact centers, or I should say, advanced customer contact centers. And another one would be uh, would potentially be sourcing and procurement. So I just threw a few out there to answer the question, but we can have a much longer discussion. It's really about that moving up the value chain into the central office. Uh, sorry, the middle office that we talked about earlier. So, okay, sorry, Esteban. Thanks. So, uh, where should we start? I mean, uh, we wanted to summarize some key takeaways from this session and some thoughts on how you can start moving forward with adopting your next generation shared service center. Uh, many shared services organizations are already already started this journey uh, during the pandemic, so they can capitalize all the benefits when when we come back to normal. So, the first one is get. The first advice would be get the basics right, right? I mean, and that includes a robust operating model, a strong and automated performance measurement, end-to-end -end process, documentation, uh, business continuity plans, governance model, um, and effective customer interaction framework. That, we, we definitely need to get the basics right before we enter or we embark in a digital transformation. So the next advice that we will give you is we should, you should probably assess your current state and develop a business case for transformation. Probably your last business case uh, was the business case that you elaborate when you were planning to implement shared services, but you never update it, you never refresh it. And there are a lot of things going on right now. So this should be your three year master plan to move to the next level, which will give you and will provide you the rationale for change um, including the to be operating models, sensors of excellence, automation, technology enablers, uh, what would be your remote virtual work assumptions, expected benefits, and the implementation roadmap, how you are going to put all the pieces together to move into the next generation shared service center. Uh, the, the third item is um, probably during the setup of the shared services, there would, have, there would have been services that were deferred due to capacity, technology, and other reasons. So it may be time to, to see if these opportunities are prime for implementation. Um, accelerate digital and automation capabilities. Again, uh, definitely key in this, um, in, in this new reality, and Joey already mentioned and elaborate on that one. Uh, as you scale your automation plans, you should also need to start reviewing your RPA more strategically and tactically by setting up a center of excellence. So um, definitely as you scale RPA, this is absolutely critical. Um, remote, re review your remote services as well. Uh, define how far you want to go with your future of work. Uh, there should probably be some positions that you would most likely leave them remote. So you should definitely analyze that. Uh, another important thing is one of the biggest challenges today for shared services is around skills. The lack of digital skills um, definitely holds back the ability to innovate uh, and we definitely need shared services to start finding and developing people with the talent and skills to leverage your data. You will need to then develop capabilities, technology expertise, uh, skills including data analytics, uh, should we hire or develop these skills? I think the answer is mix, a mix of, of, of both. Uh, you should also start embracing the concept of one office, as Phil mentioned. Um, uh, another important thing is defining- Esteban, I've got like one minute left, so if you, yeah. Sure, so the other thing is um, defining, uh, without clean data, there is no digital transformation. So it's absolutely important that you set up your master data governance model, 
that you identify your master data, your map your data flow, and defining data owners and data, data stewards. Uh, and, and last but not least, obviously do things differently. It's the right time to challenge the way we have been managing shared services for the last decades. Uh, we believe changes will accelerate even more, so definitely is the right time to make these changes. Uh, and finally, in the next slide, please, Chui. We will be conducting uh, on April 22nd, uh, 22, um, um, an event on the next generation shared services for LATAM. This will be an Spanish, an Spanish uh, version of this presentation, but we will be including some specific um, topics and trends regarding the development of shared services in Latin America. So we, we would like to invite you to this uh, spe special session on April the 22nd. So I just want to say thank you everyone for attending. I know everyone's got a hard stop at uh, 9.30 my time, 9.30 my time, whatever time zone you guys are in. So thank you very much for attending. If you have any follow-up questions, there are some other questions we didn't get to. So we will coordinate those questions and do a Q&A uh, as a follow-up. Uh, and of course, you can please feel free to contact us either directly, myself, Esteban or Chewy, or through Sarah, and would love to discuss, because uh, we could talk all day about this stuff. So, uh, but we're out of time. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thanks a lot.